And we are live for another episode of First Strike. Lots of content this week. Uh, Ginger's all the way in Seattle for the mocks, for the Magic Online Championship. But we got Andy back in the house. How's it going, man? Oh, fantastic. Excited because uh, I think Andy and Elliot are really excited to have this guest, our special guest tonight. The first one is a man that is one of the, according to me, one of the hottest names in Canadian Magic. I've been lamenting a few episodes ago that we had not been hearing any names, new names. We always hear the same names at the top of the food chain, whether it be Alex Haynes, Sean McLaren, Lucas Siao, same name, Sammy T. All of these keeps coming, being the same names. And then Edgar with many, many good finishes for almost a year now. And we got this guy, a detective. Someone's always on the case for the best deck. Someone's also the best player west of North York. We've got Sean Dollywall in the house. How's it going, Sean? It's going great. I'm loving life. I'm happy to be here, for sure. Uh, and someone that, that D. Rude, David Rude, is really hyped about also. So excited to have you on, Sean. I don't really remember when the first time I heard your name was. <laughs> uh, I don't remember. It's like uh, some event, and uh, these guys were like, man, that guy is actually good. Like, it was Elliot or Andy? That guy's out. The SCG good. top eight. It was the SCG top eight, I believe. And you're like, who's Sean? <laughs> and then both of you were like, yeah, he's actually really good. Like, I've heard a lot of people talk about him. And then fast forward to Magic Fest Calgary, which which face was kind of to fly me to, to do some coverage. John, John actually runs up to me quick because he was in the match or or, and he's talking to me. He's like, yeah, Sean, Sean D's in the, in the tournament. But I didn't really hear him. So I'm like, who? And then it was actually you. And then you end up winning uh, the whole thing, is it Phoenix? So quite a quite a good run. Uh, let, let's just go to the beginning. Um, how did you get started in Magic? And how did you earn the nickname or, or, or this title of being the best player in West of North York? I, I'm really curious. So... Uh... I first started Magic when I uh, went to university in uh, Western Ontario, like University of Western. And um, basically what happened was I was in a biology class and I saw someone playing Hearthstone in front of me and I started talking to them about it. And they're like, you know what, forget Hearthstone. I'll introduce you to this other card game called Magic. So I went to a, a cons draft and I opened a foil polluted Delta and uh, I got, I got kind of hooked after that. Um, started like playing standard, watching a lot of coverage, going from there, and like fully immerse myself in like the, the Western Magic Club, always drafting every Thursday. And um, yeah, it began from there. And uh, I think I was like, as everyone is, I was like really bad when I started. And uh, you know, I used to get made fun of for that. And then, and I was super slow as well. And then when I started getting better and better and better, um, people would say, oh, now you're top 10 London, now you're top five London until I finally climbed the leaderboard and I'm, I'm currently holding the seat of top one London. So uh, that's basically how my story started, I guess. And now I'm, I'm the best player west of, you know, North York. I don't know how that one started, but, you know, I'll take it, I guess. <laughs> that's awesome. Elliot, how do you hear about John? Uh, well, back when I lived in Kingston, I used to travel to pretty much every PPTQ that I could. Uh, so we would often drive out, you know, it was only a couple hours to Toronto. So we'd make a trip out of it. Um, ended up playing a lot of the same PPTQs that Sean did. And so I kept on running into him, uh, kept on seeing him do really well. And that's where I first heard the legend of the best player west of North York. Um, and I didn't actually get to know him that well. You know, like kind of had a few mutual friends, didn't talk that much. Then we ended up testing together for the Pro Tour in Cleveland. Um, and it was really sweet. He's a really great player. So it was nice to know him. He's really fun to hang around with. So I'm glad to see him doing well. Glad to see him, have him, glad to have him on the show with us. And uh, I'm glad he's killing it. Uh, John, like you, you've been picked up by Harry T to be part of their team. Um, when during the time that you jump started uh, into pro, uh, well, more competitive Magic, have you heard about these these big Canadian names? Do you know about the successes of D Rude, of Gabe Sang, and all of that? Well, uh, so I first ran into them at a face to face showdown. We we're playing um, M25 Limited sealed. And I played against Gabe and, um, you know, we finished our, I mulled a four in game three and we have like a really crazy game three and I somehow win it. And afterwards, you know, I heard them saying like Gabe was kind of new. I don't know if that's the, the word to use, 
So I was like, oh, you know, you, you seem pretty good for someone who hasn't played a lot. Like you're, you're pretty good for being new. And, and then <laughs> immediately afterwards, I think it was rude. was like, you know, this guy's won a pro tour, right? And I was like, there's no way. So I, I Google their names and I see their, their names with like Gabe Nassif and stuff. And I find out like Gabe Sang just came back to playing like three days ago. And he, he was already just crushing while we were playing a win and and he ended up making top four, like conceding to Rude. And I'm like, wow, these guys are insane. So I started uh, talking to them whenever I'd see them at events. And then at one point, uh, we played at the, the Guilds of Ravnica pre-release. And I asked Rude, um, you know, I heard you guys are doing a testing house, like draft camp on Tuesday, the, the, day, uh, the week before GP Montreal. Can I test with you guys? He said, okay. So I, I booked it to Hamilton. And we did some testing and then uh, I got to know both of them from there. And uh, the rest is history. Now they picked me up on uh, Team His uh, sorry, team uh, Harry T. And I've been really enjoying my time there. They're great players, all, all six of us. So we have Isaac, Christoph, Andrew Abella. Um, get some great testing in, bounce ideas off each other. And I think it's helped me grow as a player. I think, I think, I don't know. You've been hot. And then every time I see you wear that Harry T shirt, it's just the hot streak continues. So it's got to be some good luck there. Um, let's jump straight to, to this past weekend. You, you made top eights in GP Madison. Uh, what was your were prep for, for the weekend? Um, so I watched a lot of coverage, uh, especially the Pro Tour, because, you know, they're the best players playing the new set. Um, did a lot of sealed on Arena and drafting on Moto and just talking with a lot of the players that I know that are really serious about draft, especially Gabe. He has, like, his spreadsheet always for every set. Um and just like figuring out card evaluations, he has every card ranked uh, where he would take it. And just going from there, figuring out which archetypes I like, which key cards are in each archetype, and uh, practicing opening mythics. That was one of the bigger uh, skills I needed for the for the GP, and it worked out. <laughs> was, was there anything um, that wasn't apparent to you at the beginning of, of this format that, that you now know or something that uh, people – are either overrating or underrating? I think people, well, especially me, when I uh, started the format, I overrated, um, sorry, excuse me. I overrated things like Tamiyo's Epiphany. Like, I still think that card is amazing. It's just so much of the card advantage comes from uh, Planeswalkers. So, for example, uh, like Jace, if you get an extra Jace activation because your opponent didn't pressure your Jace, you're already up a card if your opponent's spending turn four, like casting four C, Tamiya's Epiphany, they're they're falling behind on board and important. Um, so I think people are owning some of the cards that don't really affect the board. Like that card's still obviously very good. It's just you you really need to play to the board while also preparing for the late game. Um, I think it was Alexander Hain that said that in the first uh, table for two. Um, and I I went after he said that I started really thinking about it and and playing that way. And uh, it's really been helping me. Um, like I'm putting two drops that I would no normally like never put in certain decks because I feel like I need to uh, attack my opponent's planeswalkers. For example, like Sky Theater Strix is not a very good card, but if you play it on turn two, and your opponent plays a three mana walker, you can immediately start pressuring it. For example, so I think uh, people are overrating cards that um, generate value without impacting the board, and underrating cards that are, are weak two drops, for example, but really do pressure your opponent's planeswalkers. So once you made top eight, how did it feel, and how did you feel going into the draft? Uh, I felt pretty good. Uh, both my top, uh, my both of my day two draft decks were were quite good, I think, and people were underrating like the aggressive strategies. I had a red green deck, where I had a bunch of the gold green uh, three drop, and a red white deck that had four uh, tenth district legionnaire, and um, like those archetypes are among the weaker ones, but if you get the premium cards in them, you can still do well. Uh, so I was feeling good going to, into my top eight draft, although it didn't really go too well. Um, my teammates were watching the draft and they said that the person that was passing to me was taking weaker black cards and the black cards that they were passing to me. So I thought black was pretty open. Like I got a bunch of Spark Harvest, Eternal Taskmaster and pack one of Nexalicis Cruelty. And then it turns out that he was actually in black. So, uh, I got pretty cut in pack three and my deck ended up pretty bad. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, so this format's really interesting to me, Sean. Like the the prevalent thought on Twitter is that this is a very Prince format, i.e., bomb tastic, like very heavy on bombs. 
and people are lamenting how, oh, uh, my opponent opened X, Y, Z, and I didn't, therefore I have no chance. But um, Lords of Limited, uh, a favorite podcast of mine, which really d digs deep into the, um, the every limited format, said that um, the commons and uncommons are pretty pushed as well, and you can win without them. So, like, Prince of Popper, like, what are, what are your thoughts? Um, I think the bombs are pretty absurd in this format and there are just a lot of them. Um, I would agree though that like the power level across the board has been pushed. Like we have, un we have commons that would normally appear at uncommon, like Omnic Solicit Cruelty, um, Jai's Greeting, these cards are incredible at common. And we have amazing uncommons as well, like Arlen Cord, Eternal, Skylord. Um, so I do agree that if you find the open colors in a draft and, um, are able to get these premium commons and uncommons, even though you won't, don't get any of the top tier bombs, you can still build a very good deck and find ways to, to beat your opponent's incredible bombs. It's not going to be easy, but it's possible. Like uh, I know in the semifinals, um, a, a player had to cast an Ugin three times to win a game because he had two aid the fallen. But so so like two, if two Ugins are beatable with commons and uncommons, like there has to be ways to beat um, bombs if you build a, a good deck and are in an open uh, open two colors in your seat. Yeah. That's interesting because um, I helped some of the Vancouver guys test um, for London, and uh, uh, I, I tried a red white deck, for example, that had like a bunch of like ten district legionnaires and a bunch of agro agro cards and all that. And my conclusion was that like, hey, you know, like everyone kind of starts above twenty life because there are so many must kill planeswalkers and the ground gets gummed up, etc. There are no no good two drops and all that. And yet, like as you said, like you seem to have a lot of um, lot of uh, a lot of success with those like red aggressive decks uh, at least at a uh, was it Cleveland like where, us wherever it was so um, so it, it does seem like um, the basic tenets of drafting which is you know find finding open lanes still do work and they're like you wouldn't really like avoid a color or avoid like an archetype yeah I, I'd agree with that <laughs> like I think people um sorry excuse me I think people uh, avoid white a little bit too much. Like I think Laru Enforcer and Trusted Pegasus, for example, are just really good. And if you're able to get a bunch of those cards, you can put together a pretty good uh, beatdown deck. Um, the card that I think is really important for red aggressive strategies is uh, Raging Crunch. Um, it just way above rate and uh, lets you really pressure your opponent. There are a lot of two threes in the format at three mana, so uh, having a four three attacks into them pretty well. Um, so I do think if you if you draft your your aggressive deck well. Um, it is. It, it can get there. I do agree that slower decks that are, are working towards bombs are, are better. But if you're in a seat that you can't really draft a deck like that, you're going to be forced to draft some sort of aggressive deck. And knowing how to draft that, I think, is going to be really important. And I, I do think red is just a very good color. So if you're uh, able to get, you know, some good red removal spells, you're able to um, take those two drops highly because you are right. There aren't many good two drops. I think you can still build a good deck. Interesting. All right, let's let's jump into some some constructed. Uh, Sean, have you did you jam? Is it Phoenix more after uh, winning the MCQ at Magic Fest Calgary? You made day two of of the GP. Day two didn't go as well, but you still put up a strong finish. Um, yeah, did you play uh, more of it later on? I haven't played much. I uh, tried one finale of Promise in the deck. Uh, just at like at local tournaments and it was fine, um, but no, I haven't played much modern uh, since then. Just mostly limited. And this week I was practicing standard for SCG Syracuse. All right, shout outs to, to Andy in the in the secret chat. Well, not not so secret. I said that uh, you've been a great insightful guest so far, <laughs> and Andy says you're the best guest west of North York, so <laughs> that we've ever had on first strike. So shout out to that. Um, Man, if anybody from West of North York, you're listening, come on, like tweet at us, challenge us, challenge them for the title, feel free. Uh, so Syracuse, so that's gonna be standard, right? Yeah, that'll be standard. Okay, where is your head at now? Are you playing? Are you jumping on the Is It Phoenix bandwagon, or were you already on it? <laughs> uh, where am I right now? Is either playing Azorius Agro or Mono Red. Um, it's mostly because I don't think I have enough reps on on anything <laughs> on anything else right now. I think both decks are pretty good. Like uh, in the MPL, a lot of the players were bringing an Azorius Sagro deck, um, and I'm inclined to listen to what they say just because they're they're so much better than me. And uh, 
Monored has been putting up good results. I know uh, Marcus Thibault, he, I was talking to him and he won an MCQ with it last weekend. And uh, he sent me his, his list and his sideboard guide and I've been looking at that and deciding between the two decks. Um, I think Esper Hero is also just a great choice. I just don't have the reps on it, I think, to uh, play it as well as the other two decks. Mm, okay, John, John with that little smile there because he, he gave Marcus that list. John's very, very on the mono red train. Uh, that's why the, the title of the episode is called the uh, Mono Red Cabal. Uh, we might have Marcus on later on uh, the second part of the show. Um, Andy, where are your feelings at as the original, at least within our, our, our first strike uh, group, to be on the Esper mid range, Esper Hero, Esper Heroes list? Where are you now, my man? Uh, I still think uh, Esper, I think Esper Hero is the best deck in standard. And I think what it has going for it is that it's extremely adaptable. Like you can just keep, there's so many like uh, flex slots in the deck and there's a lot of uh, pieces that can keep moving. You can attack almost any metagame and you have powerful cards regardless of the metagame. Like there's cards like D Spark waiting for any time that, that card gets good. It's extremely efficient, cheap, uh, great answer. And uh I think it just has all the tools. I think people are still trying to figure out the lists. Like people aren't sure whether to play any deputy of detention, any of the like four mana enter the battlefield, like uh, bell haunts or the guild mage. People just aren't sure how to build it yet. And I think uh, like once that gets like fully solved and we get to the point where we have like what everyone is like thinks is the consensus best list, I think it'll pretty much take over. Honestly, I think it's very powerful. Whenever you get to play turn two hero, it just feels like most matches are a buy. Like the mono white deck cannot beat the card hero precinct one. And there's a lot of really good curves that you can have against mono red. And I think you're actually slightly favored in the matchup. So I think the biggest uh, boon to it is that it's bad against is it Phoenix and it's a, a little weak to control. Um, can, can you go over some of those key differences that that people are fighting over if you have a strong take on on some of them like whether or not you're playing bell hot whether or not you're playing some uh amount of sore and, and stuff like that uh, i'm constantly changing my four drops i have no clue what's, what's uh, the best four drop yet i've played a ton of bell hunt a ton of guild mage i've played a bunch of uh, deputies i've played no deputies i've played three sorens no sorens i think uh I think Soren is good. I think Soren is one of your best threats against control and is the best uh, card against uh, other planeswalkers. So, like in the mirror, it'll kill planeswalkers because when they minus, usually uh, Soren can pick them off. So, I think Soren is actually good. And uh, I think uh, Derek top aided with no Sorens, and I think that that is wrong. I think you should be playing some number of Soren. And I think Deputy is kind of bad. Deputy is actually really good in the mirror because it's super good at like cleaning up tokens and you don't really care if it gets bounced or anything and everything else is like a bad tempo thing when it gets bounced, but deputy, you don't really care. So I think deputy is pretty good in the mirror, but I don't think it's good enough against other things. It's very good against mono white, not good enough against the other stuff. So I think, uh, yeah. So like right now, what I would play is like one to two, so probably two Soren and, uh, no four drop. No other four drop other than maybe one hostage taker. And then just play removal. And I main deck two duress. I think uh, main deck duress is the best addition to the list I've been playing lately. I think it's phenomenal. <laughs> Six discard spells with Thief of Sanity is insane. You board in duress against mono red anyway. Right. They're, all their toughest threats are the four mana of things that are hard to deal with and everything else you can sort of deal with. So I think main deck duress is just easy money right now. All right, Elia. Someone else that's playing this that, that's been playing that deck. What, what do you think of of? Is anything that Andy said total garbage? What's your take? Uh, I definitely agree with a lot of what he said. Um, I, on the other hand, while the deck is very tunable and you can build it to beat like pretty much whatever you want, um, you know, within a certain a certain degree, some of the decks are at the end of the day built to beat up on Esper Hero, and you're going to be end up. Uh, really sk slanting your deck heavily, you know, maybe too far to try to beat them. Um, but I think that means that it's really not a deck for everyone. Uh, you know, there's probably going to be a weekend uh, where, you know, the Esper Hero decks cut their four drops that gain life and all of a sudden Mono Red squeaks from maybe like a 50% matchup against Esper Hero to, you know, 
55, 60, and all of a sudden mono red's the best choice for that weekend. Um, I think it's very similar to a couple formats ago when we had that, you know, a big back and forth that lasted a couple episodes of what's the best deck in standard where Derek just kept insisting it was black green and, uh, but just guy control kept having really good results and Derek kept saying it's unplayable. And I don't think that's, you know, it wasn't wrong then. And I don't think it's wrong now to say that Esper hero is the best deck in standard, but I think that especially with a mid range deck like hero, that's super customizable. Uh, it's not always the best choice to be playing it. Um, that being said, you know, if you have the time to put in and you have, think you have a good read on the metagame, that's definitely where you want to be, in my opinion. I know that if I'm not going to Syracuse this weekend, um, but if I was, I'm, I would 100% be locked in on Hero. Um, there's a few things that, you know, I was kind of spitballing. Um, no idea if they're good, haven't tested them, but things like the Immortal Sun and replacing the Planeswalkers, maybe playing just some three mana to fairies, just because. I think such a huge percentage of the metagame right now is really reliant on their Planeswalkers. Uh, Andy mentioned that the deck can sometimes have a pretty rough Esper, uh, Esper Control matchup. You know, people are popping up playing Esper Control matchups, or Esper Control decks, rather, with like 11 Planeswalkers in the main deck and only some Dovin's Vetoes, no Absorbs. So, you know, they have no way to remove an Immortal Sun once it's resolved. It's pretty much lights out if it resolves game one. Uh, I think that it's going to be really good in the mirror because, you know, you obviously have the Teferi 3, so it negatively affects you. But uh, game one, again, there's no way to remove it, no way to counter it. I guess Hostage Taker can remove it, and that's maybe a pretty big liability. Um, but your opponent's probably going to have, you know, four, five, six more Planeswalkers than you. And, like, a lot of the threats you really care about in this deck are Planeswalkers. You know, Sarkin's very good against you. The Jeskai Planeswalkers decks exists. Uh, People are playing the four color command, the Dreadhorde Planeswalker deck. So maybe maybe uh, the Immortal Sun's not a card you play in Esper Hero. Maybe it's a sign that some other deck should be playing it, and it's really good right now. Um, but I think that's a direction you be, could be going in. And again, it really speaks to the, the flexibility of Esper, because we've been spending the past two or three weeks talking about how good Esper is and locked in on 10 Planeswalkers in the deck. And I, th I think it's possible you could just pivot. I should want to talk about that real quick. Um, we were talking about the Immortal Sun a couple of days ago, and uh, Isaac is is playing Tuna's sideboard as a Blue Red Phoenix instead of Nib Mizzet, and we're we're trying to figure out if that's actually something good for uh, Syracuse because it, it does seem really well positioned in this meta. Well, six mana in Is it is a uh, pretty rough when you only play twenty one lands, but uh, I guess I can understand it. The problem is that Narset's passive still just annihilates you. So I'm yeah. not sure if that'll work in that deck. That's I don't think true. Nimbizit's any good, actually. So maybe it's better than nothing, because I think Nimbizit's kind of bad right now. Yeah, I do think the big difference there is that when you play Nimbizit in the, the Phoenix deck, is generally you untap and you win the game, just because you have so many cheap cantrips. You're going to draw enough cards and be able to kill your opponent. Uh, versus uh, the Immortal Sun may quote-unquote effectively win you the game a lot of the time, it does take a lot of time to accrue that advantage. Uh, you know, compare. I was I was brainstorming it in the Esper Hero deck. You know, turning your one one hero of precinct one tokens into two twos that's pretty big game. Um, but you know, turning Arclight Phoenix into a four three kind of doesn't really matter. So I think you're kind of passing up half of the benefit there. The cost reduction is also not something that's like two two key because you're probably going to have Electromancers in your deck anyway. Um, but, you know, any additional cost reduction is nice. And, you know, obviously drawing cards is nice. Every deck can use that. We, have, we haven't covered... How many reps do you have with the white weenie deck or wet weenie that people are calling, uh, Sean? Because we haven't covered this deck a lot on this show, and I'm wondering how you feel about the deck and what the matchups you're looking forward to with that list. Um, I played it uh, starting Tuesday this week. Um, and but I had played it a lot last season. Um, first thing I noticed is that uh, a lot of the matchups have changed. Uh, it, it's not the same deck as it was last season. Um, the the enter the God Eternals is one of the biggest problems I found, and uh, also like Andy mentioned, 
uh, you can't really beat a hero on two a lot of the time. So we're thinking about playing like Baffling End in the main deck, which is really bad against Esper Control, but we have a, a feeling that Esper Control will be a little less played this weekend. Um, I have, I found it to be solid. We, we tested the Esper Hero matchup a bunch and like we're moving towards like a bunch of Disdainful Stroke to call the Honor Guard, a Johnny, uh, Gideon as ways to combat the matchup. But um, I still think you're pretty like, decently unfavored. So if that uh, prevails in our testing, then I might just move to Mono Red. Uh, because I assume Esper Hero will be the most played deck at the at this tournament. Yeah, I think I think that's that's a fair assessment. Um, John, John, I'm saving you. Uh, do you have anything you want to talk about these other archetype? I'm saving you until Marcus comes on. Um, no, I I think um, it, it's kind of interesting because uh, like half Twitter seems to have this take of all oh, experiment range is bar garbage, and half of them says it gets the best. I do think that it's the Saltaya Blast format where it's very, it, where the power level is very high on its own and uh, it's very malleable in terms of what you want to beat. I think like uh, blue, white, and black can pretty much cover all bases. And if, you, if, they, if it wants to beat X on any given weekend, it can. And the real skill and the real art will be like predicting your metagame and tuning it. Um, I, I tried Andy's list last weekend for the, for the RPTQ just so I could try it. I went uh, 06, 0306 drop, and uh, mid range is definitely not for me, but uh, it's definitely for some people. I'm, I'm just gonna keep I'm in red, I guess. Right. Uh, one more topic before we let you go, Sean. Uh, when you won the MCQ at a, at a Magic Fest, do you get a flight or not? Uh, I don't think they get flights at all anymore. Uh, I didn't get one for the MCQ at the, at Calgary. So, not okay. great, but yeah. Okay, that's one of one of the topics that uh, have been going on this week. Uh, and G Fabs, Jared Fabiano, just tweeted out, "What do you think about the GoFundMe pages for Magic players are cute for Barcelona? Great, let's support or comical pay yourself." I'm even seeing um, some stuff on my Facebook where um, they're saying like uh, pros setting up GoFundMe. Pages is the saddest thing in 2019. Um, how, how do you feel about this whole thing, Elliot? Uh, I think it's, you know, a little unfortunate, but I think the fact that, you know, people are kind of putting themselves out there and asking for help to get to these tournaments, I think that's like a, a pretty big net positive. Um, I haven't obviously checked every GoFundMe, but I'd, I'd imagine somewhere out there, someone's taking advantage of the situation, which is very shitty. Um, but like I know for me, when I qualified for my first pro tour, you know, it it meant so much to me to kind of like reach that level and go get to play one that I think I was like very lucky that not only did I get travel comp, but I could, you know, afford to go take the time off work, all that and not have to worry. Um, and I could definitely, you know, I've, I've heard stories. One of my friends, um, you know, back in the day qualified for a pro tour in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and, you know, tickets were like $2,000 and the whole thing was just like impossible to go to. There's no travel comp. So the first pro tour he qualified for, he skipped. And like, I, I can't imagine, you know, thinking that like you've hit it big and then finding out you can't go. Um, so I'm, I'm really, you know, thankful to the community that, um, people are helping people get there. Uh, I think that I've also seen a, a a few people offer to do this, um, which is front the $500 min cash uh, to people so that they can afford to go. Cause I think that, you know, from you know, like the travel comp that you got from wizards was either they paid for your flight or they, after the event um, gave you an additional stipend and you, you didn't get the stipend before. So you needed to be able to like afford the flight to start. Um, unless you had them book it for you. So depending on where you were going in the world, it was a different amount. I know for me from Montreal to Cleveland, it was, I think it was 600 US, uh, but for some people from, you know, like the Toronto area to London uh, was a thousand US. So obviously the $500 min cash is a lot less than a thousand US if you're flying from the United States to Europe, um, but it does kind of cut into it a bit. Um, 
I think at, at the end of the day, you know, if you have zero dollars to your name and you can't afford a hotel, even if your flight was paid, you know, maybe pursuing uh, competitive and professional magic is like not for you. And that's really unfortunate. Um, at the end of the day, we're playing a hobby. You know, it, it is a game and you it's not like you're not entitled to go to every event as sad as it sounds. Um, so some of the people who are, you know, I, I saw one GoFundMe where the guy said he like fully foiled out his deck after winning the MCQ, didn't know his flight wasn't paid for and can't afford to go. And it's like, it's really sad to me. Uh, but I'm just like really hoping that, I guess I, I'm hoping he gets the help he needs to go to the tournament because it sounds like he was really excited to get there. And it's kind of shitty. There's no more travel comp. Uh, and I'm glad people are helping out. Um, yeah, I'm seeing another subsequent tweet from, from Gerard asking all the winners, like where they won, what was the first place, uh, first place prize. Um, I think, I think it's unfortunate, uh, that for some places they couldn't give out more. Um, I don't want to toot face face too much, but our, our MCQ, it was at, at a higher price point of entry. It was after tax, it, was, it came out to $80, but First place was 2,000 credit, and we were offering up to $1,000 of the credit. Could be applied, could be exchanged for a travel stipend. So people thought that was pretty sweet, and I'm glad people ended up liking it. So, John, John, do you have any uh, takes on this topic? Yeah, I do. But uh, first of all, not even like an intended plug here, but I, I did some map looking around um, MCQs, and face to face, you guys by, had by far the highest. Um, in, highest uh, price payout in terms of the uh, the total buy-in taken in uh, uh, and the percentage of that being paid out. So congrats to you guys, because like some of the ones that we have around Vancouver, in my opinion, is like the payouts, like just, just not great. Um, in terms of the, uh, I have a few opinions about the uh, what's what's transpired here. One, um, this, this may be, uh, seems like an unpopular opinion, but in my opinion, I think that Wizards was going above what was reasonable by offering everyone 100% coverage of travel costs, no questions asked. And that was also agnostic of where you qualified and where the location was. Like in my opinion, the um, the ideal solution is to give everyone a reasonable uh, travel stipend, which I understand people did be, uh, they did before. And I think people that are getting mad at uh, Wizards axing this is a bit, like their rage is a bit misplaced. Like they've done a lot of things that are very misguided or clueless, but I don't think this is one of them. Um, second, uh, I think it, it's really cool that uh, the community is banding together to help those in need. And I'm, I'm I fully supportive of that. The one concern I have is like, now that like the first few have come up on Twitter, like everyone's like doing it and it's hard to really discern like who's doing this uh, out of real need, which is someone I, I would personally want to help and who is doing it for profit. And I saw somewhere that like people were doing a GoFundMe to go to a magic fest. Like, come on, like I, I don't want any of that, right? So, like it, it's gonna be harder and harder to like, dis like try to discern like who actually needs them and who's like worthy of help, and because like I can't be vetted, right? So, um, that that's kind of unfortunate. And lastly, like I know I might sound I might sound like an old man yelling at clouds kind of thing, but um, I feel like. If you are qualified, trying to qualify for a pro tour, I think you needed to have some amount of foresight. Like li life needs planning ahead of time, right? And if you can't go because of timing issues or because you can't necessarily afford it, I mean, it's Barcelona in uh, uh, vacation season. Like you needed to have like some contingency plan or some plan for getting there. And I, I kind of dislike the um, ask first, uh, short, sorry, shoot first, ask questions later sort of mentality because. If I wasn't able to, if I was in a position where I couldn't go because of uh, work reasons or because I can't afford it, I, I would I would try to like take a responsible route and like not go. That's what I would do. Maybe I'm a buzzkill. I don't know, but like, <laughs> I, I would really like prefer to plan ahead. But I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Sean, are you going to be able to make it okay to Barcelona? Uh, I, I should be good. Um, I already know some people that are queued, and we're going to be staying together and. We're even thinking about maybe staying for an extra week uh, just to chill. But um, I think I should be okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, which which Pro Tour is this for you? Which MC is it? Is this uh, your first oh, this, one? Your second one? This will be my second. 
Your second. Okay. Any, yeah. Anything you would do? Uh, we'll leave you with this last question. Anything you would do differently um, heading into uh, this one? Are you? Is there any specific things you really want to make sure you have down to, to give you the best, highest chance of success? I think I need to focus more on draft for sure. Um, the first time around, like it was a, a RNA draft, uh, Ravnica Allegiance, and I didn't even know that the Clear the Mind deck was a, a deck going into the Pro Tour, which is like pretty bad. Um, and, and like I lost to it in my first draft, and then I learned about it. Uh, so like I need to focus on draft, make sure I know all the decks, uh, how to draft everything. And I, I think that's how you're going to get your biggest edge now because everyone always shows up with good constructed decks. But, um, if you play well and draft well and, and limited, you can give yourself a, a pretty big edge and try and four, two or five, one. Sweet. Sean, any, anything you want to say, shout out, anything you want to plug, uh, floor is yours. Uh, just want to. Shout out uh, Harry T for being my sponsor and uh, everyone that supported me throughout um, playing Magic. Uh, I met a lot of people and a lot of people have helped me uh, get better. And uh, without them, I just wouldn't be uh, putting up the results I am. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to thank a lot of people uh, for that. Thank you so much, Sean, for coming on. And as with Edgar and, and other sickos that, that have been rising, I hope, I hope you do come on uh, again, uh, definitely. For sure. Thanks for having me. All right. Xiao Shan. That was Sean Dalywal, detective. The detective who's on the case, um, who's one of the names I said, I tweeted out that you should uh, keep your eyes on. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting time. It's an interesting time in magic. And, and I, I'm seeing it. Uh, maybe it's been happening, but... This year is the year where I've seen more Canadians uh, be be more more known. Like the the SCG leaderboard, you're seeing Dom Harvey, you're seeing Matthew Dilks, you're seeing all these names. And I don't think I felt that way in, in previous years. I mean, even our local MCQ was won by an old schooler, like a really old timer in Bosu. Like you know, you have all these old names. Um, it's time to see some fresh faces. And <laughs> all right, um, while I try to get. Uh, Marcus and John, uh, talk to me about Mono Red heading to this weekend. Yeah, so my 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 thought on the thoughts on the position of the deck hasn't really changed, and I, I just think that the meta game is not structurally um, uh, equipped to uh, fully beat and crowd out Red right now. Because I'll say this again, like the one of the reasons, like why I. Um, for the past past two standard seasons, I've always started on red. And if you go to my goldfish, I've had like some good results in the uh, first few weeks of red. Um, in the past two seasons, is because like red punishes nonsense, and the power level is really high as is. And uh, war has added two key pieces here: one, Tundra uh, Fire Artisan, which is another four drop card advantage bomb, and. More importantly, I think Pibble has been a very underrated piece of the puzzle here. Like, just there's like infinite life gain right now. There's Enter the uh, God Eternals. There's like Elite Guard Mage. There's Moment of Craving, Rest, etc. And Pibble just, like, just no, none of that. And those two additions have been really good, good for me. And as long as Wild Growth Walker has it continues to stay in uh, retirement, which actually kind of seems debatable given like uh, Car, you've been playing that. Four color check pile abomination planeswalker deck. Like other than that, like there's no wild growth walkers anywhere. And if that's the case, like the value proposition of red is one. It can always have the nut like aggro draw where it can deliver you out in five turns. Marcus, in fact, at the PTQ had two actual turn four kills in standard. Like that's crazy. And two, even if you get ground out in the first few turns, frenzy is a messed up card and. In Frenzy and um, Tundra, you ha you can ha actually have insane like late game comebacks as well. So if you can play a good game in both the early and the late game, like I think there's something really powerful there. So I'm, I would still um, recommend Red uh, pretty highly, in fact, uh, for this weekend. Yeah, um, we got Marcus Tebow in the chat in in, in the house. We just ended up winning the MCQ. Dominic crushing, getting right back on the MC after years of trying, getting in there the first time just recently. He's able to get back on the track. How's it going, bearded one? 
I muted you, so I don't know if you know how to unmute. <laughs> okay, there so, we go. So rude. Who unmutes? Who mutes? Anyways, no, I'm sorry. I'm just a uh, my opponent's thousand years storming me on moto. It's not 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 a good time. Oh, he conceded. Never mind. All right, perfect timing. Uh, so yeah, it's been great. You know, I get to go back on the pro tour, and uh, I'm pretty pretty stoked. I was about to swear there, but I really controlled myself. It was nice. <laughs> So how do you feel about the deck? How did the tournament go out? Was it just smooth uh, all the way to the top eight? Uh, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't like the deck. I didn't like anything. <laughs> I, I played every deck like I always do, and I tried the Esper Hero deck because I've been playing. I was playing that deck like last format for a little bit, and I thought it was sweet. But then I was like, oh, sweet, it just gets all these dope cards. It has to be great. And then I just couldn't win a match ever. Uh, I don't know how the deck does, but. Uh, yeah, I just like played mono white for a whole bunch because I really enjoyed that deck last format, and I couldn't beat anything with it, especially Esper Hero, and I knew that deck was going to be Omega popular. And then I was just like, well, John's just crushing with red. I'll just steal fucking Control-C, Control-V, and we're all good to go. Um, but uh, I changed like one card because I, I hate Risk Factor. I think that card sucks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I easily peasily won. Uh, I played against the Mirror three times uh first round was red green aggro my opponent kept some loose keeps and uh just steamrolled them then it was mono red mono red mono red only losing to one of them when i had an active experimental frenzy they had no cards on board and i ended up drawing like 12 lands so that was a delight uh obviously after after that wasn't uh, the best of times but then i just didn't lose so that was a enjoyable time uh, in the finals, sorry, not the finals, the, I want to say the quarters. The quarters, I was playing against uh, Gavin Bennett, a uh, local grinder from here, long time he's been playing. But he had, he was playing Esper Hero with four, uh, four Bell Haunts and Oath of Kaya and just like basically just tuned to beat me. I'm just like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm leaving here, you know, get my $80 store credit, and we're out of here. And then he just keeps some loose hands, and I just turn for him twice. And, uh, yeah, you know, you can have a million cards in your deck if you want, but if you don't keep a reasonable hand, then, uh, well, no magic is played for you. Then I play against uh, Bant Midrange in the semifinals. My opponent also keeps some kind of mediocre hands, uh, misses, God Oketra's ability twice, and I uh, just kind of fold him over. Uh, he gets very upset at himself, uh, which is pretty funny. I thoroughly enjoy when people salt off. Uh, and then the finals was against Esper Hero again, but his list was really strange. He had a lot of, like, Esper control cards in his main deck. He had, like, Dovin's Veto main. He had, like... Uh, he had a lot more Enter the God Eternals, and I think, John, John, did he say, you said he had, like, uh, he had Small Teferi, Big Teferi, Soren, and he had one more Planeswalker, I can't remember what it was, but he had just had, like, he just, like, took the, both the decks together and just, like, mashed them, and he's just like, oh, I'll just play four heroes, why not? Put them in. Why not? Um, and, yeah, I, I beat him in two. The first game was uh, kind of a steamroll, but the second game was just, like, I ended up with like 11 lands in play. Uh, went through like half my deck, didn't draw a Chandra or an Expendal, Experimental Frenzy, and still won. So my opponent played God, uh, Enter the God Eternals, two Sorens, two Teferis, two Oath of Kaias, a um, Frass's Contempt, just like the whole nine yards, and I still won without even the cards that were like actually good in the matchup. So, like, that seems to attest to how powerful the deck is. Hmm. Sick. Sick. Uh, one thing I wanted to pick your brain on, specifically, since you, you say you've played against three mirrors? Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to hear your thoughts because I, I was following uh, – I've been practicing last week with Christian Hawksless, who, who decided that his, his plan was just minus the Power Mancers, minus the Fire Brands, and adding – he didn't add the war bosses. Now, I think a lot of players I talked to at the tournament, the Montreal MCQs, they were bringing the, the war bosses. Um, John has has his own approach as to, uh, to the mirror. And uh, even even someone, Joey Smith, local player, mm. who uh, of Shadowverse fame, 
who just like hasn't been playing in a long time, really does a lot of unorthodox stuff, like picked up the deck on the day and just felt like he did something crazy where he felt like it was right to take out frenzies because he's like too slow or too bad. <laughs> and and he, was taking, he was taking that approach. So <laughs> and other people kept their power mentors in or, or some people just to be able to you know, do a shock effect. So a lot of people have different perspectives as to how you're supposed to cyborg in the mirror. So, and I wanted your take. Sure. Uh, first things first, uh, don't keep one mana one ones in your deck. That's a good tip. Uh, the deck plays four chain whirlers. You probably don't want to put one mana one one in your deck after sideboard. However, all of my opponents did. And to my surprise, they, they lost. Yeah, that card is not good in the mirror. Don't keep that card in. Uh, I am pretty, pretty, I love all the four drops. I bring in all of them, so I have six post board. Uh, Nine times out of ten, most of the matchups usually end up just going like, okay, bolt your guy, can't get him for two damage, bolt your thing, lab a coil. It's literally just like, it's a kind of like a Jund mirror, but like all your cards are just garbage for the most part, except for uh, like the big haymakers. So if you land a haymaker and your opponent doesn't, like nine times out of ten, you're going to win. Uh, unfortunately, one of the times I had the, uh, you know, the one percentage, but whatever, like no big deal. But I really like cutting, I think it was like four Firebrand out no matter what. And then on the play, I like keeping the um, the Steam Cannon. And on the draw, I like uh, cutting uh, cutting the Steam Cannon and cutting, uh, putting, uh, keeping the Pyromancers in. So, so, yeah. so on the play, cut Pyromancer, keep Steam Cannon. On the draw, cut Steam Cannon play uh pyromancer uh pyromancer is not great it's but it's like steamkin does literal zero on the draw and i don't want to just be like all right turn to steamkin and then my opponents were like chain whirler and i was like oh well cool throw that in the bin uh but i'd prefer to keep it uh at least keep uh put it on two and then on your turn three you can cast a couple spells make it out of range of chain whirler or even shock possibly but uh it's pretty simple for the most part i feel like just cut the cards that are not good play ones that are better simple well, do you like war boss uh i don't love it i actually don't think i brought it in uh <laughs> let me just check i have a sideboard guide written out i'm pretty sure i i possibly brought in one because okay. i didn't have anything other anything better to to put in uh let's just check mirror match all right, so I brought in, yeah, I brought in one on the play, and uh, on the draw, I just put in the fourth lab of coil. So on the play, I would bring in two dire fleet, the experimental frenzy, the Chandra, the three lab of coil, three lab of coils, and on the play, I would bring in the one war boss. On the draw, I would instead bring in a lab, a fourth lab of coil rather than the war boss. Um, you said you don't like risk factor. Were you able? Did you bring it in at all? Like you, you uh, still had one copy. Yeah. Two, two. I, I have two. Uh, John was playing three. I only liked the card in maybe two matchups, and it was Esper versus Esper Control and the the uh, Nexus deck. But I noticed the Nexus deck was just like on the extreme decline, so I just didn't want to play the card anymore. And I'm very happy I didn't. I played against Esper. I did play against Esper once, but like it wasn't even needed for the most part. Actually, the, the one game I actually cast it, I didn't even win. So there's that. But uh, I don't I don't really like the card. I hate giving my opponent the choice of just like, you know, here, which mode do you want? This is what it's going to be. Like, three mana deal four is not great. But I mean, three mana deal eight and discard a card is probably fine. But most of the time, like, it's always good when you're just, you, you like see it and you play it and you're like, yeah, this card's great. But the times where you draw it and you're just like, my opponent's at 16, it's like, man, this card is the worst card physically possible. Um, oh, also there's like the, the, the Narset thing where it's just like actually just a zero. So, and almost all the blue decks now for the most part are playing Narset, like except for, you know, Esper Hero, I guess. But like the control deck where it's actually good against, they're just playing Narset. And they're just like, oh, nice three mana draw card, <laughs> like <laughs> sweet, thanks. But uh, yeah, I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of it. I, uh, I actually moving forward, I wanna, I wanna kind of completely from the deck. Oh, John, John, did you hear anything that that you you're opposed to? 
not really here. I think I think risk factor is still um, very potent against uh, decks like Esper Control and Grixis Control, uh, which is also rising as well. Um, I, I do have a few thoughts regarding the list going forward. One, I think the six six four mana bombs is still correct here. Um, not only are you tuning uh, your deck towards the mirror because. Like I, I would say, like seventy percent of the times, it's all about the the four mana bombs after jumping each other out. Uh, and two, like I think war boss is more potent than risk factor, so I might like go plus one war boss, minus one risk factor from my uh, battle battle uh, battle plan uh, list, uh, because I think war boss is much better against the super friends deck that's popping up, whereas risk factor kind of gets got by Narset or Dobin's uh, Dobin's passive. And three, like I, I might try to diversify my, um, I might try to diversify my card advantage cards by like maybe putting like a, uh, what what is it called treasure map because treasure map uh, dodges D spark as well as what is it called? Uh, sorry, D spark as well as mortify. And uh, given the Esper color decks are the most prominent right now, I might go towards that. Uh, also, it's like. It's a two mana card advantage uh, play that can um, that can go under like absorb or whatever. So other than that, like I, I think uh, Marcus covered a lot of what I, what I would what I would have said. Right. Uh, any uh, Marcus? Any remaining advice for people heading down to SCG Syracuse this weekend? Uh, practice. Uh, that's like the best tip always. Everybody. I mean, I unfortunately did the opposite of that for this mcq i kind of just like winged it i played like two leagues of mono red and went four and one and then like one and three but like i would just say practice i mean try and find people that are going down practice with them you know build your gauntlet whatever normal things that you should be doing anyways but i mean if you really want to i, I would suggest doing that if you want maybe some you know, hot takes or tips or anything like that. Unfortunately, Ginger's not here, so he can't tell you how good whatever he's playing is. Uh, <laughs> but um, I don't know. I would just say, like, play what you enjoy. Like, I wouldn't try and muck around now because people are pretty set in stone. Like, maybe there's some super secret deck that's out there that uh, wacky four-color deck looks like a disaster for my, my deck, except if you just never draw the 1-3, but... I mean, that deck could be okay. I have no clue. Uh, there's the silly... Uh, uh, there was a tournament in, I want to say, Japan or whatever that had this like wild list that was just out of there. It had the 4-mana 5-4 with Trample in black and green that when you like deal damage with it, you bring back a card. I think that deck like top-aided. Granted, the Japanese players do whatever they want. They could just like go through a random bin of cards and be like, Yep, putting this in my deck. That's my spicy one up for the day. Like, they could play anything. Uh, I really want Mono White to be good, and I don't really understand why all the MPL players are playing it. But <laughs> you can't beat anything with that deck, so I don't really understand why you'd play it. I think like the the highs of the deck are still super high. You could just go one drop, one drop, one drop. Play your elephant. And the game's almost over. But the lows are just so low. You're just like, all right, let's keep my two lander. I have like two one drops. Oh, my opponent played anything reasonable. Crud. <laughs> like my opponent played an 03, and I'm just like, just dead. Can't possibly win. Uh, I would suggest. I mean, I don't know. I I enjoy mono red now. It's it's pretty fun. I think it's pretty good. Esper hero still fine deck. I don't think the Nexus deck is still well positioned enough like especially with mono red still reasonably high uh i'd probably just play esper hero or red i mean i would play red again but like i'd probably play one of those two decks honestly unless you're very adamant on playing something else if you're pretty flexible i would suggest giving those two a try honestly sweet like you you <laughs> As usual, as you as you did last episode, I love hearing you break down things. It's very detailed, and you and you covered a bunch of decks. So, I really appreciate that, Marcus. Just want to hear Andy's voice again. So, you know, can you believe it, Andy? Random subject change, just for one second. That uh, right before, right a minute ago, the Portland Trail Blazers were beating the Golden State Warriors with Damian Lillard scoring zero points. He has four now, but uh, impressive. I, I assume CJ McCollum is is doing his takeover. <laughs> I'm not watching the game car because I'm on a podcast. But uh, thanks for the update. 
I got, I got, I got, I got ESPN scoreboard. I'm not watching. You can't. I'm, I'm rooting. For, I'm rooting <laughs> for the Trailblazers. Um, I, I'm hoping to make it a series. Uh, okay, good. I got, I got my my fill of Andy, uh, Marcus. Is is there anything uh, you want you want to plug here? The floor is yours. Oh well, in that case, uh, I mean, I'm going to the pro tour now. Uh, I have. Uh, I'm going to try and do a stream pretty soon to try and get some donations. Uh, as you just had on Sean, you had the topic of, you know, MCQs with uh, the prize payouts and stuff like that. And yeah, Jeep Babs hit me up on like what the prize was that I won, and it was not a lot of money. Uh, it was actually none. Uh, I actually won zero. Uh, we chopped it so like second place got basically everything. But even if I won, I would have still only gotten 300 store credit, which doesn't do anything. Uh, I have some help that's already happened, but the flight from here to Barcelona is $1,500, uh, and it's not cheap. And even with my full-time job, I unfortunately am unable to pay it and life. So I am not starting a GoFundMe because I don't enjoy asking for money. I Actually, the opposite. I, I hate asking for money. Uh, but I'd like to try and get something if people want to donate or if they want to, you know, give me a high five, you know, sweet. Uh, if you don't, that's fine too. I don't mind. Uh, but I plan on doing a stream with some other people. I have some people in the line and they're going to do some giveaways. I have like a mountain of play mats here. Literally right here, just a mountain of flame mats. There's some face-to-face -face ones in here too. Uh, but I'm going to give those away, and I'm going to uh, give away some arena packs and some other stuff and see if that works out. If it doesn't, then I'll just uh, you know eat some SpaghettiOs and play on the Pro Tour. Um, do, do you know when that's happening? Uh, uh, yeah, it's actually should be next Thursday is what next. I'm trying to. And they should go to – where should they go? That's www.twitch.tv dot uh, slash ghost x empire got it down pat sweet sweet um so a any other type of magic you've been playing do you have your head in modern and any other formats lately well of course uh i would really i've got some uh, cooking in the books a, a bunch of uh modern players have uh seen that there's lack of expose or what's the correct word you know something like the, the the vintage super league and all that jazz so i've been uh playing some stuff with a bunch of other streamers and we're gonna should be coming up soon we got a lot of stuff cooking and it'll be a, a good thing but unfortunately i'm not allowed to say anything about it i really <laughs> wish i could because it's really really sweet and i really want to but uh other than that no uh modern's great uh, it looks like Karn is just uh, destroying all the formats. I saw the uh, top five picks of you guys, and man, you missed out on Karn, except for John, because he's a smart man. Uh, <laughs> that card is just destroying all formats. Like it's it's pretty funny. I snap bought four, and the card is great. Uh, Edgar is just snap bought four. Looks like he had the the Japanese ones. They look sweet. Yep, right into Primeval Titan Land. Like. <laughs> Tron land, Primeval Titan land. I even saw it in like just some uh, miracle build and legacy. Yeah, jam it in. Uh, like, uh, what was it? The uh, the stupid deck in legacy where you play the one mana one one that when it dies, you get two basics. I can't remember what that deck's called. Uh, whatever it is. Uh, there's, yeah, just jam it in there. Nick Fit, that's it. Nick Fit, yeah, jam it in there. I like saw a list at four, uh, five out or four one. That the only artifacts in the sideboard were <laughs> Ensnaring Bridge, a Pithing Needle, and the Mycosin Flat. It sounds like that sounds terrible, but yeah, let's do it. Like jam it in. Why not? Uh, but I've seen a lot of decks 5-0 with uh with Karn in their deck, and yeah, the card's just absurd. Like actually just bonkers. I would suggest uh trying some some Karn. Add some Karn to your life. Spice up your life with uh some Karn, you know. I see John. John nodding his head. Um, uh, did, did all of you see the the Mox trailer, the video trailer on YouTube? I did. It was pretty intense. Some people hate it. Uh, did, do you think? Do you think uh, they did a good job? I thought it was cool. I thought it highlighted uh, how outclassed the competitors are by the commentators. <laughs> oh yeah, at the end, yeah, where they show all the commentators. 
it's kind of a yikes. Like, I, I really wish they showed off everybody. Like, they gave, like, obviously they're going to showcase the, the known players and stuff like that. But, like, is is uh, Derek even on there? Like, is he, like that's kind of weak. Just, like, why isn't uh, Tuan Nguyen on there? Do you know that he's in the, uh, the tournament? Like, I certainly didn't. <laughs> like, that sucks. It's like you're you're qualified for the biggest tournament you're probably gonna ever play, and you're just like they don't even know I'm in. Cool. I think one year uh, somebody from here actually qualified for the mocks. He was in the paper. Like that's dope. It's a huge event, and they're just like here's a slide of you know Jabberwocky fifty times. Cool. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I really like the uh, concept and production of the video. Um, I I do wish that we got to. Uh, no more than just the face of the um, well, some of some of the more well-known players. I, I understand there's timing constraints and all that, but you know, at, at least like showing like everyone in some capacity. I think I would have liked that. Like, obviously, it's it's kind of a bummer that there wasn't on there, but just like for the other 23 players as well. So, I think it's um. Let me see. True. Listen, if you got one minute to make a video and you can't fit them all. Derek ain't making the video. Okay, fair. <laughs> I'll that. I think they. I want. I wonder what the what. Well, it's not my job. It's Watsi's uh, st marketing strategy job. Like they did an insane job. Uh, we all raved about the War of the Spark official trailer, eleven million views, and then there's there's another one teaser at six hundred and sixteen thousand views, and then we have this mox trailer. I don't know how what they could do, but it's like two point seven thousand so 2700 only 2700 people watched it that's really low really really low and and i'm not sure i, I wish more people were hyped about this, about this video. I, don't, I, I have never like watched the mocks i've watched <laughs> it maybe once it's just so the view, viewing the mocks is nice because it's cool but like you don't know most of the players and half the battle is like going for the players that you know right so i think that's part of it is a Unfortunately, a lot of people don't care to watch the mocks and don't care about. It. Well, luckily for you, if you're planning on watching it this weekend, you can expect a four-hour break in the middle of the show. What? There's a, a four-hour lunch break between noon and 4 p.m. <laughs> uh, Pacific time for the MPL to play their matches. Oh, my God. So I hope you're not too invested and have four hours to kill if you d if you are. Can you imagine just waiting four hours in the middle of a tournament? I've done it. it that was GP Vegas. <laughs> it's like literally between round two and round three was three and a half hours. We, we went home at 11 p.m. that night, and <laughs> that was not fun. It was brutal. We couldn't even go out to eat in Vegas. It was awful. Yeah, I really think that sucks, like, for the MOS competitors, just, like, that event is, I think it's huge. Like, it's one of the biggest events. It's been the biggest event on Moto, period. Like, people, there's hundreds of tournaments for it. There's lots of people trying to get into it over and over again. There's people grinding the leaderboards. And it doesn't seem like they put a lot of value into it. It's just, like, obviously the MPL comes first because it's the MPL. But, like, they've just been jamming, jamming, jamming the MPL. And then they put the MPL a week before the biggest moto tournament of all time and they're just like oh yeah here's the box like i guess so <laughs> like that sucks that's so <laughs> brutal like it's they don't even have to they barely have to give it any recognition ever uh, but like at least something is is better than nothing and like yeah i guess like a video is cool but just like why isn't it why aren't they posting it like nonstop? why haven't they been posting it for like months or whatever just like it's a huge event for lots of money lots of things i mean i wish i had a sweet moto signed jacket that uh, derek's gonna get that looks gonna be awesome like i uh you get to tour watsi you get to just chill and see all the people that are there you get to go to oh so sweet rent in washington come on um <laughs> there's like it just seems really crummy i mean obviously there's the reduction in coverage which you know nobody 
personally enjoys. I mean, I mean, maybe some people do, but I'm certainly not on that bandwagon. But that event is the easiest to cover. You don't have to really do anything. You just have to put a camera in front of Moto. Like, your camera probably has a better system than the friggin' Moto does. Like, just put a camera on it, or two, I guess. You can have them sitting back-to-back, -back, like, side-by-side, -side, like, old Lamb Cafe style, and just jam. Like, this is the easiest thing ever. But there's, I mean, they're going to have it, I guess, but... It just seems like they could just be doing so much more and with like so little effort. Like, didn't somebody somebody posted on Twitter that they did all the player profiles for all the people for free, and like Watsi didn't ask them to do it. It was just some random Twitter account that's just like, here's everybody, all their all their stats, all their everything. They just did it for free, just because I didn't know it. Like, who else is gonna know it unless you specifically scroll through Wizards Oso oh Magnificent site, <laughs> trying to. You know, treasure map your way there. Agreed. Uh, Elliot, like, it's common knowledge that these MPL matches are, are pre recorded, right? I certainly did not know. Uh, I don't know if it's common knowledge, but I don't think it's like a super hush secret. I'm, I'm seeing it on, on Twitter. Um, some people spec <laughs> say that. And so it's kind of funny that they're going to have a four hour block of, for, for pre recorded uh, footage. We can't possibly do this at another time. <laughs> um, it, was yeah, super, it was super funny. At the MCQ, Jerry was there, and I was just like, isn't the MPL today? Like, huh? It's like, is he just going to, you know, log in from Mox Boarding House and just jam his MPL game? Like, I guess that's cool. You could probably do that. And then he, somebody told me, he was like, oh, it's pre-recorded. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> well, that's Why would I even watch it now? That blows. Um. All right. Any, anything else you want to plug, Marcus? We're we're gonna end the show. We're gonna wrap it up. Yeah. Shout outs to John. He's the best. The end. Shout outs to John. He's Great. the best. Thanks for having me on. All it's right. Good, good luck. Good luck with everything uh, next week on your stream, my man. Thanks, man. All right. That was Marcus Tebow. Just ended up a recurring guest and just ended up. Winning an MCQ with Monoran this past weekend. Um, I've been testing, as, as John mentioned, I've been testing the, the check deck uh, popularized or made by even Flock and um, someone else named Escapes Me, but Strasky's popularizing it by streaming it, trying to get the Mythic 1. And I think I think it's got legs. I think this deck is actually one of the better non-Tier 1 decks in the format. If I were to play again... Uh, if my tournament was tomorrow, I'd definitely play Esper Hero or Mono Red, but this is definitely something to keep an eye on because Command the Dreadhorde is, is actually a really, really powerful card. Um, it's leading to a lot of silly games uh, that I'm crushing in the MTGO. Yeah, I love that uh, getting screenshots at 11 a.m. when uh, Car's at Face to Face <laughs> Games uh, headquarters, I think. <laughs> From his uh, Magic Online account, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I, but... uh, it's pre-recorded. That's what it is. <laughs> I was definitely grinding late night, and John can attest to that because we were. I was online at like three a.m. Uh, chatting over things, and uh, I think I think this is it. I think this is uh, a deck to to keep an eye on uh, if you're looking to try something funky. And John told me that even Tom Ross covered a bit of how he would tweak the deck on SCG Premium, right, John? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. what was that? That, that you, you said that Tom Ross, you told me that Tom Ross covered the deck. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it has, like, something's going going for it. And, uh, yeah, Wild Growth is good, and the, the Commander Dreadhorde is, the power level is certainly high. The mana base is so dirty. I don't know. Yeah, the mana base is pretty bad. <laughs> I'm not going to... Not gonna lie, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Um, when when you're trying, sometimes you have games where you really need double black to, to play command, and, and you don't. You have a bunch of uh, colorless lands that can only cast for planeswalkers. So with that, anything else you want to leave us? Leave the show with Andy. Uh, no. Uh, watch watch my video series playing. Is it Phoenix? Uh, yeah, but play Esper Hero. <laughs> 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 play as per hero 5-0 though uh, getting lots of views people are actually like searching for, for that deck probably and yeah, uh, I think uh, I think it was the best deck in the format for last week 
I think nobody was ready for it. Uh, Nexus deck is not playable, which is by far your worst matchup, and nobody was ready for it. So it just won a bunch of the PTQs. It's on the front page of magic.facefacegames.com and he's sweet face. So click that if you want to watch some Is It a Phoenix? Elliot, anything else? Yeah, I just want to add on top that uh, you should watch Andy's video on Is It Phoenix? Because I think it was the best deck last week. Uh, <laughs> but play Esper Hero this weekend. <laughs> John, anything else? I think I just want to plug the uh, our own face-to-face -face, uh, battle plan. Um, I was going to do that. I was going to do that for you. Okay. Well, let me just say that uh, inadvertently, I, I, I wasn't even trying. Like I, I kind of kind of let like six people locally uh, going to Mox Boarding House's uh, PTQ on red on my seventy-four or seventy-five with my uh, sideboard philosophy, and we collectively went like. 30, 34 and 12, like like 65, 70% win rate. I know Sebastian, uh, as I said last week, won, uh, top eight there as well, and Marcus obviously won it. It's very detailed, and I put a lot of time and effort into it, and it's obviously got a lot of uh, uh, testing behind it as well. So, um, yeah, check it out. Okay. Whoa. Hardcore typing, Elliot. First time you forgot to mute. <laughs> Oh, my bad. <laughs> five. So if you want to check out someone 5 owing a competitive queue, go to magicfacefacegames.com. That's Andy's Is It Phoenix Competitive League. Definitely check that out. Best deck last week. Um, also, go plug patreon.com slash first strike if you want to give back to the show and also get the benefit of having some of the guides that we produce on a monthly basis, including John's uh, guide for his 74, 75 card list that you can bring to your MCQ, uh, go to patreon.com slash first strike. It's not just a deck list with cyborg plants. Him, he actually goes through every matchup and has text um, for every one of them. And, and what he does is actually anticipate what he feels the opponent is bringing in and out. So if you're Kevin been playing standard, going in with a blank sheet, that's actually the mono red guide that I would recommend out of all the guides out there in the world. And I'm not just saying that because he's here. It's definitely, um, he goes deep. And I also want to plug in because Caboose is in the chat. Fredericton Open is this Saturday. Modern, I don't know what's going to go on. I don't know what Caboose is playing, but uh, definitely look that up. Uh, more information, go to ffseries.facefacegames.com. And this is the second episode of the week. Uh, I want to shout out Sean again uh, for being an amazing guest. Uh, I thought I knew who I heard he was the best player in West of North York, but he was an awesome guest offering great insight on draft and, and his limited experience at GP of the format for GP Madison. And I think I picked up a few things and also appreciative that he decided to plug sort of plug table for two, my other show that I do with Alexander Hain. Uh, that John keeps bugging me for a third episode, and I hope to be recording another one this week. So, and with that, we will see you next Tuesday, hopefully, with the latest, greatest Mox champion, Misplaced Ginger. So we'll see you there. <laughs>